Uh, in studio with me, the uh, uh, man known as the Admiral. It says so on his jacket, so I know that for a fact. <laughs> Bill Stubblefield. And that's I look down at that jacket all the time to make sure it's the right one. That's so how you know who you are. <laughs> that's how I know. That's exactly right. <laughs> New York Times bestselling author, John Gilstrap. Good morning. He's always under deadline. That's the great thing about being an author. Even after you publish a book, there's another one due at some point. Sometimes they're farther away. What are you up to? Uh, 29 uh, books now? I'm working on the 29th. Working on the 29th. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Uh, Bill, you, you're published as well. Haven't you written some serious uh, papers uh, that uh, are academically reviewed? Yeah, I've had several academic papers, uh, peer-reviewed uh, scientific papers, but yeah. it doesn't compare to uh, to John's book. I, I admire someone that has the discipline uh, and the patience to actually work up a novel. I've been I've written the first paragraph of several novels, but it stops after the first paragraph. If only we could get you to do the same when I introduce you. <laughs> now, what does that mean, John? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, we've been kidding all fair. Ron, uh, Rob is really slicing. Well, Ron, and dicing. Ron has been. Well, not Rob. Sorry about. That. <laughs> Rob has been slicing and dicing uh, uh, John Gale scrap, and I'm happy with this. I like to see John come out in shreds. But Honestly, don't, don't stubble fill. I think that a hidden camera in here to catch the off-air conversations <laughs> would be very entertaining for people. Well, Field Marshal von Gilstrap. <laughs> Uh, his his platform includes kicking seven year olds out of school for the rest of their life because they chewed gum once and stuck it on a desk. I've always thought Ebenezer Scrooge was not really understood. <laughs> he was a softy. He was. He was a softy. Yeah. Our guest in this segment for the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy is the Executive Director Kelly Allen. Kelly, good morning to you. How are you? Hey, good morning, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Uh, great to have you with us here once again. The legislative session continues to roll along here now. Uh, we are approaching crossover day, so pretty much uh, uh, what's going to be taking place in the next couple of days is going to be ultimately uh, the, the bills that we finally can figure out and debate here. And, uh, you know, the the state, we had this discussion yesterday, Kelly, in regards to federal funding with one of the candidates who was on, uh, Janet McNulty, and the state gets a lot of federal funding, and a lot of that washes through on Medicaid. Is any of the Medicaid funding state-funded as well, or is it all washed through federal spending? Well, there is state funding. So Medicaid is essentially a federal state partnership, um, and for every dollar that we spend at the state level, we pull down about 280 uh, in federal funds. Um, it's really important. There's nowhere else we could get that return on investment for the state dollar. Uh, and Medicaid covers health coverage for kids, for families. Uh, it's the source of long-term care for seniors, home health care for folks with disabilities. Uh, but, yes, it's a piece of the state budget, uh, but it's also a revenue source since we use that match to pull down federal funds as well. So this was it kind of generated out of the discussion of the federal deficit, which is in the 30-something trillion dollar range, and it had to do with balancing a budget, slashing federal funding. What would that look like in West Virginia if we slashed a lot of funding from the federal government to West Virginia and the, a chunk of that was in Medicaid funding? Well, I think it would be potentially pretty devastating for West Virginia. You know, a lot of times when we talk about reducing uh, federal spending, we're kind of essentially talking about pushing costs down onto the state. Uh, and it kind of happens at the state level, too, when we talk about spending that the state can't afford, whether that's for EMS or um, school funding or whatever. We're, we're essentially talking about pushing that funding down to the county, right? So it's all kind of pushing it down to the next level of government. But, uh, again, Medicaid is a really important source of health coverage for a big chunk of West Virginians, particularly uh, seniors, kids, families. Um, and, you know, it's also a really important source of our healthcare economy. We say it's the cornerstone of our healthcare economy. States that have expanded Medicaid, as West Virginia have done, have had few rural hospital closures. Uh, their hospitals have better operating margins. They have more access to care, like OBGYN and other specialized care. Uh, and it also drives jobs. We can talk about it later, but uh, BBER study from John Duskins at WVU, who does a lot of analysis to the legislature, kind of played out, you know, if we cut $100 million from Medicaid, uh, which is the state budget deficit or shortfall that uh, Medicaid's facing this year, uh, they estimated because of that matching loss in federal funds, that could cost the state about 5,000 jobs. So it's important to families, it's important to our healthcare economy, and it's really important to our economy as a whole. 
What does this look like at the end of this uh, 60-day legislative session in terms of the, the reality of what might happen with those funds, Kelly? Well, you talked about this being a really important week. Uh, yeah, this is we're coming up on crossover week where we find out what legislation is going to make the cut and actually have a chance of getting across the finish line. It's probably the first Saturday we'll have to work this session to get some of those things across the finish line. But, you know, from our perspective, even though it's kind of flown under the, the radar compared with some of the more eye-popping legislation that's been moving, uh, we think one of the most important things our lawmakers can do during the 60-day session is to fully fund Medicaid, again, the cornerstone of our state's health care economy. Um, and one way that they can do that is a bill that's moving through the House. I think it's on first reading today and should be up for passage Friday, uh, House Bill 5647, uh, which would um, a lot additional state dollars for Medicaid by increasing uh, what's known as the MCO tax, uh, a tax on the providers that provide managed care services to Medicaid recipients. And essentially it allows us to leverage those dollars to pull down more federal dollars to meet the needs of our people. You say raise that tax on providers? That's right. But the managed care organizations are supportive of it uh, because essentially it allows them to pull down more federal reimbursement dollars. So they have expressed their support for for House Bill 5647. Bill? Yeah. Uh, Good morning, Kelly. Uh, How does the SNAP program uh, play into this? Uh, There's uh, some of the bills in front of the, uh, the House and Senate now that would reduce the SNAP program. How does that affect? Well, it's, I mean, it's separate from Medicaid. It's another safety net program. It's another program that we're, you know, seeing a lot of legislation introduced to, to cut uh, eligibility for, just like we've seen some bills around that would cut eligibility for uh, Medicaid as well. Um, and SNAP, again, we're kind of going back to federal dollars. SNAP is a 100% federal program. Um, legislation uh, is moving in the Senate that would make it less accessible to people, older West Virginians, specifically to West Virginians between 53 and 59. Uh, And it would require them to uh, go through a lot more kind of bureaucratic red tape, uh, work requirements and able to to qualify for the benefit. Um, And what we're finding and what research shows is enacting that red tape, it kind of costs the state a lot more, right? So you have to put in state dollars if you want to manage a program where you have to uh, have more reporting, more uh, more strings attached to the program, but what you're essentially giving up is federal food assistance dollars. So Senate Bill 562, one of those uh, bills that would cut SNAP, we've seen the food banks or the food pantries push back against it because they're saying, you know, we're giving up these federal dollars um, and this is going to push more people into the charitable food sector. Uh, we've also seen some retailers ex- express concern uh, about what less you know, federal food dollars flowing into uh, rural retailers could mean for everybody that relies on rural grocery stores and retailers. So I think um, these are a lot of bills that sound maybe reasonable to folks in a vacuum, uh, but once we realize how uh, intertwined and how important these federal dollars are in our local economies, for even people that don't rely on Medicaid and SAP, just keeping hospitals and retailers afloat, um, they're actually potentially pretty harmful. So what's the motivation of the Senate bill uh, to put restrictions on recipients of federal dollars? It's not state dollars, federal dollars. What's what's the motivation? Well, I think that um, there are some outside interest groups that are pushing uh, these attacks on the safety net um, who are who are lobbying in our state house. Largely, it's not West Virginians who are asking for these restrictions. But I think, you know, the the good-hearted, I think, motivation around them is that reducing access to programs like these will make it um, kind of force people to work if, you know, this is what's keeping them on the sidelines. But what we actually know is, you know, folks who are outside the workforce, well, first I'll say most people who rely on SNAP and Medicaid are already working. It's kind of the reporting requirement piece of things that often trips people up. Um, but also, if people are outside of the workforce, there's usually a good reason, whether they're, you know, caring for children, caring for elderly, aging pa- parents or family members. They don't have access to transportation. They need job training. Um, so we're really glad to see child care be a big focus of this legislative session. Uh, but generally, you know, people prefer to work. People would like to be in the workforce, uh, but sometimes they just need the supports, whether that's transportation, child care, job training, different things like that, that are generally more effective for helping people rather than taking away food assistance from them or health coverage. John Gilstra. Specifically with regard to Medicaid, you, you talk about you'd like to see a bill that would fu- fully fund Medicaid. Uh, is there a pushback on that? And, and what's the disparity between what is being proposed and what would be fully funded? 
Well, I think um, there is some question about why Medicaid ha is experiencing a $100 million shortfall this year. Uh, and that really goes back to the, again, we're talking about federal stuff a lot today, but the federal public health emergency. So, uh, Excuse me, I, I don't mean to the, interrupt, just for definition of terms, a $100 million shortfall in Medicaid in West Virginia? In the state, in, yes, in the state budget. So um, that's what this uh, House bill, I think, 5276, or I'm sorry, I just made that up, 5647 would fully fund. Um, but really the reason for that $100 million gap in the state Medicaid budget is because during the federal public health emergency, uh, we talked about how Medicaid's a federal state match. Uh, the feds actually increased their share of funding for Medicaid. So instead of about getting about $3 for every dollar we spent, we got $4 for every dollar we spent. Um, so we were actually able to pull down a lot more federal dollars for the Medicaid program during the public health emergency. That resulted in about $700 million extra coming into the state. And that meant that during the that period, we were able to reduce our state spending on Medicaid by about $100 million a year in the general revenue budget. So essentially, on January 1st, the federal match went back to normal because all of the federal COVID era programs have ended. Um, so we just have to start putting in basically our pre-pandemic levels of match again. Um, so this is really just returning us to pre-pandemic levels of spending. Now, one problem there is that during uh, the pandemic era, when we were getting a lot of extra federal money, we permanently cut state taxes, uh, in part because we, able, we were able to say we could keep the overall budget flat. Uh, and some of that was because we were getting this extra federal funding. So I think that's probably why some are balking at this $100 million shortfall right now. But, but essentially, we have a lot of data uh, folks can check out on our website just showing this is really just us returning to our pre-pandemic levels of state spending. Uh, and we just had those few years where we were able to spend a little bit less because the Fed had increased their match. What is the alternative and the consequence to not funding Medicaid? Well, it would be potentially um, pretty devastating. So, again, you're not just losing $100 million if you don't pass this uh, MCO tax. You're losing what you'd pull down as well. So it would be about a $400 million hit to the Medicaid program. Um, I think it, it varies what could happen. Uh, the, the health agency has already said if they, if they had to close that shortfall, they would uh, immediately – uh, reduce provider reimbursement rates, which would be um, pretty bad for our hospitals and providers. They would look at reductions or cuts to optional services. Um, things that are considered optional in Medicaid are prescription drugs, substance use treatment, uh, care for folks with disabilities. Uh, so it's really things that we probably wouldn't consider optional that are really, really important here in West Virginia, given our, um, given our population. So these would be really painful potential cuts. And then just to go to that study I mentioned earlier um, from WVU's Bureau for Business and Economic Research, uh, for a $400 million a year you know, hit to Medicaid would mean a lot of health care jobs. Uh, and their analysis was that would cost about 5,000 jobs. So that would be 3,000 or so healthcare jobs, and then all the spillover jobs, like all of the industries um, that survive because of healthcare providers or because of where people who work here in the healthcare industry spend their money. So, you know, we always talk about all of the economic development kind of stuff the state has done in the last few years, I don't think adds up to 5,000 jobs. So we would essentially be kind of reversing all of that progress that we've made uh, if we don't fill this, and fill this hole. Is there full-throated opposition to this? <laughs> well, it's up for uh, potentially passage in the House on Friday, um, so, so we're excited to hear that. Um, we hope that it will cross over to the Senate and pass quickly. Um, there hasn't been a companion bill, a version of this, introduced in the Senate, uh, which you know, makes us a little nervous, but we hope. Uh, we think that the House gets it and sees the importance of this, and we hope the Senate will take it up quickly when it crosses over. Kelly, has there been a recent legislature that didn't fund Medicaid to the point where the federal funding was in jeopardy? The last time we had this conversation was 2018-2019. Uh, um, we were talking uh, about you know, potential restrictions on the Medicaid program, whether that was work requirements or making it harder for people to access or those sorts of things. Um, that ultimately didn't happen. Um, but, you know, when when times get tough, when there's a budget shortfall being faced at the state level or some kind of deficit, you know, Medicaid, public education, those are kind of the big things that we spend our money on. So um, I'd say we're a little we're a little nervous as, you know, lawmakers are really committed to reducing and potentially ultimately eliminating the personal income tax, which is 40 percent of our state budget, um, that these programs could come under fire increasingly. Kelly, uh, 
a different subject, carrying, the, carrying this to the federal level. Uh, the, the Social Security and uh, Medicare uh, and Medicaid are the third rail of politics. But mm-hmm. as I, as I, a, a deficit goes up, a federal des- deficit goes up, there's more and more attention being given to how we gr- uh, pull these costs in or reduce these costs. Are, is your organization gearing up for this potential fight down the road in the next two or three years? <laughs> Well, I'd say that we have our hands quite full uh, with state policy right now. Um, We haven't spent a lot of time on federal policy, although I think something we will engage on is, um, you know, in 2025 when uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that uh, was passed under President Trump, uh, some of those tax cuts could potentially expire, which would help the deficit and help the debt, right? But we'll probably see a lot of pushback because big corporations got pretty big tax cuts. So there are ways, I think, to reduce the debt and deficit by – uh, reducing spending for programs that are really popular, as you said, why they're the third rail. Uh, and there are ways to reduce the def- debt and deficit by um, taxing corporations and the wealthy and maybe some balance of those two. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we're, we have our hands full with state policy right now. I'll say that. Okay, pulling back to uh, West Virginia uh, Pacific, uh, the child care is something we've spent a lot of time discussing, both local here and also the legislative the sessions have as well. Uh, I think in previous you have written that uh, West Virginia terminates parental uh, rights faster mm-hmm. than any other state, and as a consequence, more children are being placed in foster uh, care, which has certain advantages, but also has a harmful effect on the children. Do you see this trend changing at all? Well, I mean, I think that the the legislature has really been focusing on uh, our child welfare system, but what we've really seen is a heavy focus on uh, increasing supports for foster families, which of course is really important. But, you know, I think the research that we've done really shows that we're not going to have enough resources for foster children and foster families and judges and lawyers until we slow down the flow of families uh, that are being separated. Um, And this all ties back to Medicaid and SNAP and other programs that we've talked about because really the number one indicator for uh, child welfare investigations and allegations is related to uh, economic instability. Um, economic material hardship, difficulty paying for rent and food and utilities and housing. Um, So there's a ton of data around how important Medicaid is. Uh, Medicaid expansion is associated with improved economic stability and mental health for parents. Um, The rate of neglect reports decreased in states that expanded Medicaid. So um, I'd say that uh, in order to really address our child welfare crisis in West Virginia, We not only need to think about the supports that we're wrapping around children once they've been separated, once they've gone into the foster care system, but we need to make sure biological families have the supports that they need um, to put food on the table and keep their kids safe um, so that we can slow down the flow of investigations and make sure our CPS workers have the ability to get to the cases where really urgent danger is needed or an intervention is needed. Um, So I think it all ties back to this kind of Medicaid and staff discussion for sure. Kelly Allen is our guest, Executive Director of the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy. Uh, Kelly, I want to go back to Medicaid. Uh, in the, I, I assume the legislature is going to pass this and pass it so it's fully funded so that they get the maximum amount of federal dollars. But if they don't, <laughs> right, and, and let's look down the road of the federal government and assume that you know, we, we're to the point where we can't even pay the interest on the debt any longer because it's so large. If I rely on Medicaid for my health insurance and I don't have that and I go to the emergency room for an issue and I am totally, completely uninsured, does the hospital turn me away or do they see me and eat the costs at the emergency room? Well, there's a federal law, I think it's called MTALA, that requires um anyone to be seen in an emergency room setting. Um, The problem with that uh, is that everything costs more in the emergency room, right? And uh, often when somebody gets to the emergency room, it's when something has really gotten a lot worse than it has to otherwise. So yes, if there were less folks on Medicaid, less access to Medicaid, hospitals would see a lot more uncompensated care. Um, They'd have to eat a lot more of those costs that they currently don't have to because people generally uh, are insured either through Medicaid or something else. 
Um, but also, Medicaid is really important for making sure people can get preventative services. They can get blood pressure medication. They can get things checked out before they are at that level of requiring surgery or very expensive treatment. So, um, you know, I don't envy state lawmakers that have to balance a budget every year, unlike the federal government that doesn't have to operate a balanced budget. But some of these things are really, you know, penny-wise, pound-foolish if we think about cutting programs that, you know, make sure that people are healthier. Uh, and able to work and aren't in the emergency room later, that really saves us down the line. So it's really important to think about that, too. Kelly, I want to thank you very much for your time this morning. Any final thoughts? No, and I'll have to fangirl about uh, being on an interview with John Gilstrap later because <laughs> yes, great book. Big fan. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> we got another half hour. <laughs> Kelly, thanks kindly. I appreciate y'all. Have a nice good day. Time. Take care.